Hello and welcome to the webinar. I'm Chloe Rigby, editor of internetretailing.net and I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar, uh, which is a bit different. It's in association with CyberTill and today we're giving the audience, you the audience, a chance to hear directly from members of Generation Z and how they prefer to shop. So we'll be looking in depth at how a new generation of shoppers is buying in different ways, perhaps, from their parents. This is the first generation of digital natives, and it's one that we believe is embracing new technology. But rather than relying on those assumptions, we want to find out firsthand from our panellists today, who are Daniel, Tracy, Michael, Jamil and Rach. We'll also have commentary from Martin Shaw, who heads RetailX, Internet Retailing's research business, and from Rachel Tonner, Head of Marketing at Cybertil. Along the way, Rachel Tonner is going to be sharing Cybertil's research findings from a YouGov study that Cybertil has done, and she'll also be leading the panel discussion on the subject with our panellists. Since this webinar is primarily a Q&A session, we want to hear from you, our audience, with your questions, which you can ask via the chat box on your control panel. Just to let you know, the first subject we'll look at will be mobile shopping. Then we're moving on to loyalty, to green issues and sustainability, then to omnichannel retailing and ending up with in-store technology. We hope to spend about 10 minutes on each section, but do chime in with your questions. In the event that we run out of time on each section and your question doesn't get answered, we will follow up afterwards. So to start us off, I'm going to ask everybody to introduce themselves. Can I start with our industry commentators? Martin. Thanks, Chloe. I'm uh, Martin Shaw, Head of Research at RetailX and Internet Retailing. And I've been doing that for six years now, from the beginning of our first UK Top 500 research which has now extended. We cover the whole of the single market with a Europe top 500, and we also look into Southeast Asia and Australia as well. Great, thank you. And Rachel? Hi, everyone. I'm Rachel Tonner. I'm head of marketing at Cybertil, um, but my background is in e-commerce and UX. I lead research project projects at Cybertil to help retailers understand their customers better. Um, and as part of this webinar, you'll be automatically entered into a draw where three random retailers will win a free Gen Z mystery shop and report, which should help give some insights into how you can improve your retail operation. Um, as Gen Z not only purchase for themselves, but they also influence family decisions. So it's a pretty cool opportunity. That's great. Thanks, Rachel. And now, panellists, welcome to the webinar. I'm going to ask each of you in turn to introduce yourselves. As you do, can you tell us about your most recent purchase experience? Was it in-store or online? And was it a good experience or a bad experience? Daniel, can we start with you? Yeah, hi, I'm Daniel. I'm 21 from Wigan. Uh, my last experience was good. It was from ASOS. I ordered a shirt on the Friday night and it arrived on the Saturday morning at about 11 o'clock, uh, which meant I was able to wear it on the Saturday night. So yeah, it was good. Brilliant. That worked out. Great. Tracy, can you, can you go next? Hi, I'm Tracy. I'm 25 and I'm from Liverpool. Hi, we've lost your sound a little bit. Uh, should I should I chime in, Chloe, and talk a no, little bit around? Yeah, Please. okay. So, one of the things um, um, I was interested to hear from our panelists is um, to see how many of them were going to mention uh, Amazon and eBay as their most recent purchase, uh, because um, uh, some of our, our recent research that we've been looking at is. Um, has revealed that those two giants collectively comprise about 42% of unique UK web visits to the top 500 companies, to the top 500 e-commerce and multi-channel companies in the UK. Um, and that's actually a, a similar share to other markets that we measure, um, with the exception of Australia, where it is still a huge share, but not quite as big. Um, so um, I suppose one of the things I was going I was interested in seeing from our panelists is the level of um, interest they have in uh, in loyalty programs and whether they they see other more traditional retailers as competing in the loyalty space. Yes, that's right. It should be interesting to to see what 
how that goes um, and, and what people have to say on that subject. So I think we have some expectations, don't we, about what uh, what Generation Z shoppers do. It'll be interesting to hear how that's different from, from the reality. I can see that our panellists are now dialing back in. Uh, we do seem to have had a connection problem. Um, and Hi, hopefully we're back online. Hello, do you want to share your presentation again? Yeah. Fabulous. That's great. Well, I know we had a phone issue there, so thanks very much for coming back on uh, so promptly. Now then, I think we were just hearing from Tracy uh, with your introduction, Tracy, if you don't mind continuing from there. Yeah, sure. So just in case you didn't hear, I'm Tracy, I'm 25 and I'm from Liverpool. Um, my recent experience was online shopping uh, wasn't actually a good one because I ordered a gift for someone and it turned up damaged. So when I contacted customer service, um, they said they weren't able to send me a replacement because there was none in stock in the warehouse. But when I went online, it was still saying that it was in stock. And I was told that the e-commerce and the warehouse don't talk to each other. So I was unable to, to get the gift that I needed in time. That's a lot of such good experiences, Daniel. Thanks for telling us about it. Michael, what about you? Yeah, uh, I'm Michael, I'm 21 from Liverpool. Uh, the most recent thing I bought was a limited edition vinyl from a company's website based in London called Banquet Records. Uh, overall, it was a very good experience. The item came perfectly packaged. There was no damage to it and it was included with a handwritten letter thank you from the purchase from the company. Oh, that sounds perfect. Jamil, what about you? Hi, I'm Jamil. I'm 21 and I'm from Italy. Uh, my most recent experience was in store. I uh, needed to go to New York to buy a shirt because it was my friend's birthday. And I prefer to in store because obviously I can go try it on and I can see if I really, if it fits me well. So it was a good experience because I could also use my student discounts with it. So I enjoyed Brilliant. it. Brilliant. Even better. And finally, Rach, can you tell us about your most recent experience and introduce yourself? I'm Rach, I'm 24 and I'm from Ormskirk. Um, my most recent purchase was on Monday. I um, Monday night I ordered a Mother's Day present from Zara and to get the free delivery I also added a dress on top. Um, it came the next day. Um, the perfume was lovely so I'm going to keep that but then unfortunately the dress really did not fit so I've had to return that today. So it was a good and a bad experience. <laughs> Okay, so a mixed one to leave on. That's great. Well, thank you all very much for taking part in today's panel. So, Rachel, I know that you at Cybertil have done some research. Do you want to tell us briefly about that research and what you found out about this, the way that this generation uses mobile devices in shopping? And listeners, do please ask your questions as we go along. Yes, thanks, Chloe. So um, we found that whether it's shopping via Instagram social shopping feature or shopping directly through a retailer's mobile app, um, one thing that's undisputed is that Gen Z use mobile. Um, but it, it does matter what the apps or the websites include. Um, so top one from Gen Z, 59% of Gen Z want a retailer's app to have stock levels of nearby stores. Um, they tend to be a self-serve generation, so that's very important to them. 57% want the ability to buy items directly through an app, and 47% want the ability to scan an item's barcode in store to find it online. Um, so, Martin, um, we can't, I don't think, talk about mobile without mentioning eBay or Amazon. I'm actually quite surprised that none of the panel's um, recent shopping experience was with Amazon. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? Um, yeah, so um, as I was saying before, they're very, they're very dominant uh, with 42% uh, of uh, unique UK web visits to the top 500. Um, and uh, they obviously have very good apps. Um, whereas if you look at the UK top 500 overall, 37% uh, of them have um, an iOS app, 31% have an Android app. Um, and just on what you were saying about the uh, some of the app features um, of the iOS apps, 18% um, of the multi-channel retailers also have a store stock checker. So that's less than one in five. Um, and some 17% or so have a, um, the ability to see what the stock level is um, to order via the app. So um, 
we're still seeing very low penetrations of things which uh, Gen Z is asking for. That's great. great. So we've just got a question coming in, um, which is to say about mobile, do customers genuinely use store apps on their phone or do you buy through the mobile site of a store since some apps can take up a lot of space? We've literally just had this conversation prior to the um, the panel, so I'm going to pose this one to Daniel, actually. Yeah, so I still use the websites, actually. Well, I did on my old phone. Uh, the reason being it had quite a low storage. I think it was 32 gigabytes, uh, and it had, I think it was 50 megabytes left. Uh, so when I was going down to download apps, it wouldn't actually let me, so I continuously used uh, their website, so Assess's website rather than the app. Uh, and I didn't have no problem there either. Does anybody else prefer to use an app rather than the website? I use the website for most times. Just I tend to not enjoy using the apps that most companies offer. Why not? I just always have problems with them. So there's been like a few times where I've gone to order through the app and I placed the order. The money's been taken out of my account, and then I've got an email saying that the stock level was wrong on the app, and I then I. End up with no product, but the monies came out to my account, and I've got to wait a week for the money to go back into my account before I'm making another purchase. So I tend to use the website because I found they tend to be a bit more accurate. I, <laughs> I, um, I think it's like a visual thing. I prefer to use the apps because they're much more like set out for your phone. But sometimes say like I always use my phone for browsing, but if I go to like Safari to go on ASOS's app, it's not like, like. The right setting so it doesn't appear that nice and the filters and everything it doesn't look as good right were there any other questions from the panel Chloe, at this point i mean from so, the um listeners. yes so so it sounds like you are mostly using mobile websites do any of you have apps that you do use regularly or, or is that is, is it always a case of using the mobile website um, Tracy? Yeah, I mean, I um, have the H&M app on my phone and I use that all the time. You know, H&M is probably my favourite um, shop for clothes uh, and even homeware as well. And with the app, it's just so easy. Everything is set up really nice. You can search really easy. Um, the loyalty is integrated as well. And, you know, I've not really used their in-store um, function on the app yet. I've not really tried that, but I just think it's a really good, uh, really good app, and yeah, everything about it is just really easy to use. So I'm going to ask this to all the panelists actually. So if you could say one thing and tell retailers what you would want in your ideal mobile app, what would it be, Jamil? I normally use the website and just to like I normally just browse, uh, and I would like to like go in store and try it on and then see if I want to buy it or not. So I'd like to see because sometimes when I go on a Site and it'll be online but not in store. But I wouldn't, it doesn't tell you that most of the time. So I'd rather like see if it's, there's a way to like see if it's even a store close to me, and just so I can go try it on. Yeah. So re like stock levels of yeah. nearby stores. Yeah. Makes sense. How about you, Michael? Yeah. I just just based off my own experience, what I've mentioned, just like to see just higher accuracy through the apps because I've had problems with stock levels on there. So I'd just like to make sure like the apps are constantly updated. Um, just to make it an easier shopping experience, really. Daniel? My main thing is it needs to be easy to use and navigate. So when you click on a product and then you go out of that product, it needs to leave you on the page you last was on, rather than put you straight back to the top of the page and then you have to start scrolling back down to where you was up to. Uh, I don't think there's anything worse than that. <laughs> How about you, Rick? Um, I think I would like more accurate recommendations. So. You do get recommendations on products that you've already bought, but sometimes they're just not similar. Like they're not like my style. Like I think I would like more recommendations that are my style. Okay. Um. Does anybody make so you've made purchases, Michael, but yeah. with a mobile app? Um. Has everyone else ever purchased through a mobile app? Not through that. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um. Martin, do you have any final thoughts on this? Uh, yeah, just on the 
<clears throat> Obviously, um, mobile websites are uh, bigger than than apps in in terms of uh, ev every a retailer has one. Um, but even in that space, we we you can really see a lot of um, I suppose different ways that retailers are approaching how to optimize them. So we've noticed a steady, uh, a small but steady increase in. Uh, time it takes to use web mobile websites so they're not getting faster they're actually getting slower and we think that's because a lot more features are being demanded um, and are being included in these websites and and more more imagery and and better imagery makes sense um, are there any questions from the panel Chloe about mobile any others Sorry, I keep saying that, listeners. <laughs> <laughs> but the listeners, and just a reminder to the listeners, if there is another question that you want to ask about mobile, and we we cover that briefly before moving on. My question would be, how how do you maybe envisage mobile your the way you use mobile changing? Do you think that in the future you'll make more and more purchases for my mobile? phone or do you think you'll you'll continue to balance all the different shopping channels that you've they have already mentioned Rachel um I think I'm probably going to end up using mobile more and more um I think it's probably heading towards that you'll just end up with like one tech device in the end instead of like maybe like a laptop a tablet and phone for all different things um yeah I know I use mobile most so that's probably not a fair answer <laughs> Yeah, I'd say they're the same. It's probably just going to be, I mean, a lot of times when I buy things online, it tends to be if I'm on a bus going towards university and I've got nothing to do for an hour, it tends to be I'll go online, have a look. And that's where I make like, the majority of my purchases. So I'd say, yeah, in the future, it's probably just going to be only online and use my phone that'll do it. Okay. That's great. So from here, having talked about mobile, maybe it's a good point to move into loyalty. We've heard a lot about apps and, and loyalty is often a part of that app. Rachel, do you want to tell us now about your research into loyalty schemes? And listen, as a reminder, again, do ask your questions as we go along. If you've got anything else to ask about mobile, we can catch up on that as well. Rachel. Yeah, um, there's often debate over which benefits will influence shopping, um, loyal, loyal shopping, or what makes a good loyalty scheme. Um, you know, is it racking up the most points? Is it just selling good products? Or is it delivery subscription schemes? Or maybe a combination of all? So we did some research into loyalty, loyalty schemes, um, particularly fashion. And we found that 36% of fashion retailers don't offer any scheme at all, which surprised us. 15% um, offer a subscription scheme, and 27% offer a loyalty scheme. Um, the biggest percentage, 54%, offer a store credit card, um, and they kind of package that up as, as a VIP loyalty scheme. Um, but according to our latest YouGov survey, 41% uh, of Gen Z have a premium retail subscription, so like to um, ASOS Premier or Amazon Prime. 55% um, of Gen Z don't, and when asked why not, 48% um, of Gen Z said it's because they don't shop with any particular retailer enough. Um, Gen Z often shop by category rather than, than brand, and it had us wondering kind of like, is, is brand loyalty kind of dead? Um, and 34% said that they didn't have a subscription because it wasn't worth the money. Um, so, panelists, who here is a member of any loyalty scheme at yeah. all? Yes, yeah. I yeah. am. Everyone, everyone's shaking their head. Okay, <laughs> should we start with you, Daniel? Yeah, so I've got the ASOS Premier, the Premier Scheme. Uh, the main reason is I don't want to be paying delivery costs every single time I order something. I think it's £9.95, roughly around that anyway, uh, per year. And for that, you get free next day delivery for all the 12 months. Uh, whereas I'm, if I go on to you know, a retailer's website, you know, I'll buy a £30 short, uh, t shirt. And they're going to charge me four pounds for the delivery as well, and I've got the risk of that T-shirt coming and it not being the right size. In which case, I send it back. In some some retailers, actually charge you for sending it back as well. So the cost builds up, and then you know you end up spending 
eight pounds and you've still not got a t-shirt so the access delivery the free next day delivery number one you get it next day so if you like being your last minute it's good uh, and number two you're not constantly paying delivery charge and you feel like you're you know, on ASOS I feel like you can order multiple sizes of the same item for that security of knowing I'm going to have a top tomorrow night to work so I'll order a small and a medium because sizes are different all the time uh, with my fit uh, and I know when it comes at least one of them will fit me but I will send one of them back as well but because it's free I'm able to do that. So Daniel do you think you're uh, classed as a serial returner? Yes I am, I'm a bad <laughs> customer. <laughs> I think I lost my first Yeah. <laughs> I'll not say my full name. <laughs> How about you, Rach? Um, I'm not a member of any VIP like subscription teams or anything. Um, mainly because people in my family have the Amazon Prime, so I just use that. <laughs> so you're not a member of any, but you use one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. By default, I just share the link and then they buy it for me. And <laughs> um, what about loyalty schemes, though? Oh, I'm really like. Yeah, I'm a member of Superdrug. Um, I decided about like a year ago, like, oh, I'm just gonna like commit to this loyalty scheme. I'm gonna buy all my beauty products through them, and like, I'll actually, I might see some benefits. But then last month, I went to redeem my points, and I had four pounds. So <laughs> I really didn't see like the benefit of just committing to only buying in Superdrug anymore. I thought like, oh, I might see some real like cash benefits, but it didn't turn out to be much. <laughs> Has anyone else had an experience like that where they've tried a scheme and it just took too long to get the value from? Um, yeah, I have myself. So I've, one of the schemes that I'm involved in is, is the Boots loyalty card. Um, the main reason I got one is just whenever you went into the shop on my lunch break in work, I was just getting pestered. So I gave in, family got one. But I've used it maybe once since because when I worked out, it wasn't really worth it. It was like, I'd have to buy over 100 meal deals, which is all I use it for, to get a free meal deal. So it, the hassle of taking it with me every day wasn't really worth it. So is that what the, the, the pain was? It was the actual physical card and remembering it? Yeah, just remembering it for such a small benefit. Like, I didn't really gain anything from taking it with me and didn't lose anything from not taking it with me. What do you think about that, Daniel? Yeah, so mine's not really retail, but I go to Nando's quite a lot. And there they always offer you the card. I took it up probably two years ago. And since that, I've probably used it. I go five times a month, and I've probably used it twice <laughs> in the two years I've been going, only because I constantly forget it. And I know they give you a code to go away with and put it back in on on the website, you know, when you're back at home. But you know, the hassle of having to do that, you just not the hassle, but <laughs> for the time of having to do that, you just you know, you end up throwing the receipts away, and then you forget about it. So what I prefer is. You know, either you know, doing it online, so having an online loyalty card, so you can put it into your Apple wallet, and then you just scan the loyalty card, and then it adds your loyalty points. In their case, it's Chili's, uh, which they add to your card. Just so it's easy, you can do it when you're paying, and it's all done in one go. Mm -hmm. uh, that's my personal you know, preference. So would that be your advice to retailers? Definitely, to yeah. To get yeah, definitely. To sign up. Okay. Um, is there anything else that kind of makes you loyal to a brand? besides a loyalty scheme? Uh, yeah, kind of. So one of the things which I have like subscribed to, it, it is a loyalty scheme to the Amazon Prime, but the only reason I got Amazon Prime, well, there's two reasons. One, I can get student discounts, so it worked out, I think, like £3 a month. Um, so I thought, just why not? I mean, I don't really use Amazon often, but for £3 a month, it's worth it. You know, you can use it a couple of times a year. But the other reason I got that was, um, the age I am, I play like a lot of computer games, and Amazon always run an offer uh, with a partner company called Twitch. Where if you sign up, you get basically like free bonuses in games and stuff like that. And that was probably the main reason I ended up taking it out just for like the side offers that they do with the companies. Yeah, so Amazon do really well with that kind of value added offers with the TV, and yeah, um, it's, it's slightly different because they do cover lots of different categories, whereas other retailers just use one. And anything else, like product quality or? Yeah, I, think, I think for me it's mostly about the quality, about the product. Because I had an ASOS uh, subscription, and I ended up uh, cancelling it because I had a few bad experiences with it, and I'm very fussy with clothes. Mm -hmm. So I, like, I didn't like the material, I didn't like the way they delivered it, I didn't like the customer service. So I ended up deleting it because I'm just that fussy. And, uh, <laughs> 
There's nothing wrong with being fussy. From our research, actually, um, Gen Z likes to go in store. That we'll t we'll come we'll touch on that later. But the experience of shopping is a leisure activity, but also being able to get the product right away and being able to feel it that's really important. Um, so you know, media talks about the rise of e-commerce, but actually it's it, it's the it's the store that Gen Z likes to go to. But e-commerce can help drive that. So um, any questions from the from the uh, listeners, Chloe. So it's, it sounds as if free delivery is, is the clincher in signing up for a loyalty scheme. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and that really is the bottom line, as it were. That That's very interesting. That's great. Well, Martin, Rachel, did you have a final thought before we move on to our, our next section? Um, I, I would was interested to hear Daniel talking talking about the importance of uh, next day delivery to him, and um, <clears throat> it's not uh, something which retailers are ignoring these demands. So um, we've noticed that just over the past twelve months, there's uh, been another uh, seven percent of the top five hundred have added uh, next day delivery as something they offer as as a standard thing. So it's now at sixty percent of the UK's 500 largest retailers. So it, it's uh, very much the norm these days. That's yeah. great. Rachel? I just wanted to ask Daniel, um, if you didn't have ASOS Premier, would you shop with ASOS? No, I wouldn't because I wouldn't have big grudge paying, you know, like I said before, £8 to get an item delivered the next day and then return it if it wasn't the right size. Uh, so no, I probably wouldn't. I'd probably be more inclined to go in store and buy the product, mm -hmm. uh, even though it might cost me more to go and park up and you know <laughs> petrol and so on. But you know, I'd probably be more inclined to go in store because I know I'm going to get the product. Uh, I'd probably go on the Saturday day. I'd go in, go to local city centre, get the pro get the t-shirt, and make sure it's the right size. But you know, not have that. You know, not being, you know, not feeling like um. And be a rob paying eight pound for it to be delivered and then return it because <laughs> I know more more than off, more often than not, you know it doesn't. A lot of t-shirts don't fit me because I'm at that funny size. <laughs> so a lot of t-shirts don't fit me. And it depends on the brand and you know so on. So yeah, I'm quite fussy. Okay, that's great. So moving on from loyalty. Of course, there are other things that can create loyalty as well, not just schemes and apps. Uh, sustainability, we, we hear that this is a big issue for younger shoppers in particular. Is that an issue for you? And listeners, a reminder too to ask your questions as we go along. Rachel, what, what does your research say about sustainability? Yeah, so um, a consumer awareness rises of the impact of buying habits, uh, fast fashion in particular. Um, there is a growing movement amongst consumers to be more sustainable shoppers. See on the slide now, it's this Patagonia um, campaign, don't buy this jacket. Um, so in a report released last month, the Environmental Audit Committee called on the government to end an era of throwaway fashion by offering re rewards to retailers and brands that included things such as repairs or recycle schemes in their retail operations. Um, H&M Group and Levi's are just a couple of retailers offering these services um, right now. And recently, Primark launched a sustainable denim line in an effort to help their customers shop more sustainably. Um, so there's definitely um, change happening right now in the market. Um, and according to our research, if Gen Z had to choose between two retailers, and one offered a donation service that rewarded them for donating goods to be recycled, 32% of Gen Z would be swayed to shop with that retailer over another that didn't. Um, and 18% would be swayed by the offering of a repair service for clothing in store. Um, so when it comes to buying items new, upcycled or used, 52% of Gen Z would consider buying clothes secondhand. Um, 73 would buy secondhand books, and 67 would buy secondhand vinyl and CDs. Um, and upcycling was popular with Gen Z across uh, the jewelry sector. Um, Martin, do you ha have you seen any trends towards re-commerce or resale, and any sector in particular? 
Um, on the subject of reuse of goods and environmental consciousness, um, we have recently released a report into the global luxury market, and that's a particular market where secondhand goods um, have developed their own um, marketplaces, etc. Over the last few years, we've seen a bit of growth. So. Um, Luxury brands are also working in some cases to bring these uh, secondhand sales within their own marketplaces, within their own websites, and to validate those as, as genuine products. Um, and it's both a source of additional revenue to them, but it's also a way of offering entry-level pricing to future brand loyal customers. Um, globally, over the past few years, we've seen that the second-hand sale of personal luxury goods has been about 2.3% of the full market, including new items. And the full market is about 763 billion euros, so it's enormous. Um, although, although that fraction, 2.3%, is small right now, we anticipate it will grow um, over the next few years especially with studies showing increasing levels of environmental concern among the general public um, and particularly with younger consumers. Great. So, um, Pamela, is it important to you that a retailer practices sustainability? Can I just have a quick yes, no? No. no. Uh, probably yes. 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 Okay. So it's kind of like a 60-40-ish split here. Um, <laughs> So what can you do with clothing that you no longer wear, Jamil? Honestly, I keep them. I keep my clothes because uh, sometimes I'll go back and find like a pair of jeans from four years ago and say, it still fits me on I just wear it. You probably can't do that for your whole life, but <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'll keep until it fits me, I'll keep it. Yeah, <laughs> but that's sustainable in itself, actually. Um, how about you, Michael? Yeah, I tend to just keep everything unless you know, I get a hole in a t-shirt something like that, then I tend to just throw it out straight away in the bin. But, I mean, in my wardrobe, I've got things that I bought like five years ago, and I still wear them every now and again. I go through a rotation where, you know, find something that I like having more for a while. Tracy? With me, it depends on what condition the clothes are in. Um, if they're in a decent condition, then I'll, I'll give them to charity, uh, put them in the charity shop. I'll actually take them down to the charity shop and donate stuff on gift days as well. Um, but if they're just not in a good state, then I'll just throw them away. Yeah. I I tend to put my stuff on eBay, okay. uh, which are worth. So because I buy a lot of you know, designer T-shirts, you know, they still have high value when I sell them on on the likes of eBay. So yeah, that's I I sell them on eBay and I still might get twenty pound for you know, a T-shirt which doesn't fit me anymore. So you're definitely yeah. part of the re-commerce market. Yes. Yeah. Definitely. What about you, Rach? Um, I outgrow my wardrobe quite a bit, so I have to do this a lot. Um, I. Try and things that aren't branded, I put like in a charity bag, but then things that I think I might be able to get a bit of money for, I put on Depop. But with that, it's just a bit of a waiting game, really. Like, you might not get instant money, but if you leave it up there for a while, someone might come along and buy it eventually. Okay. Um, so we've, we've got a few questions coming in on this subject. Uh, two people have asked pretty much the same question, which is, will Generation Z pay more for a sustainable product? Um, <laughs> yeah, well, 60-40 of the room said that they didn't really mind, but would you? Who would pay more for a sustainable garment? It depends on the quality. Say if it was sustainable and also was going to, like, was a, of a decent quality, then yeah, I'd pay more. But if it was sustainable and, say, the quality was just the same, I think price would overcome. Like, if it was cheaper, I'd go for the cheaper option. I would as well, as long as there's quality still there and... Probably as long as it's, as it's not, I don't know, twenty percent over the price of what it would normally be if it wasn't, you know, sustainable. I'd say no myself, just because I'm a, a university student, so you know, price is like the main thing really for me when I'm buying something. I like getting nice clothes and stuff like that, but I tend to, you know, search through twenty websites to find the shirt I want at a discounted rate, rather than paying, you know, ten, fifteen pound more than I really wanted. Yeah. Same as him, like, being a university student, I have to like, save as much as possible, so uh, I like look for the cheapest option available. Okay. okay. 
So uh, another question here, if a brand offered credit for products that were returned to them for disposal, would you use it? That might be in a store or to drop off points. Universal yeah. knobs, yeah. <laughs> so it's a yes or round, is it? Yeah. yeah. I've actually had experience of that. Uh, H&M, I don't know if they still do it, to be honest, but they used to, whenever you drop off a bag of uh, clothes, they give you a £5 voucher. And I was constantly dropping off clothes for in return for a voucher, and it was great. Interesting. Um, So, do does any does anyone here shop at charity shops? Occasionally. What uh, do you shop for when you go? It tends to be if a uh, second-hand jacket, basically. It tends to be like the most things I buy. It's not often they'll do it, but you know, it wants to be six months. If I go out shopping and walk past a charity shop to see a few jackets, I'll go in and have a look. Um, because often you get denim jackets which don't don't really tend to age. You know, you can have it for twenty years and still look in good condition. If you can go to a charity shop, one, it's cheaper for myself to buy a denim jacket from there, and two, it, it does help somebody else. And is there anything we, we, well, sorry, I was going to say we've got a slight a related question, um, which is what does the panel think about same day delivery at a premium cost, say between three and five pounds, if they live within five miles of the shop? Uh, it's, it's sustainable in that it would be delivered by a pedal bike. Yeah, I suppose there is that like question of if everything's same day or next day, like is that good for the environment, like if there's emissions and things. But I suppose if it was delivered by bike, I can't really see the problem. Um, but I think it would come down to cost. I'm not sure. I think I'd rather wait three to five days with free delivery than pay more to have it the same day. <laughs> I think yes. I think if someone was, you know, riding five miles to come and deliver my t-shirt, I think it's probably worth the three to five pounds. Uh, for the delivery myself on the same day in the last minute. So, yeah, I think I can't see a problem with that. Would you pay it? Yeah, I would if I was last minute. I wouldn't pay it you know, every day, but if it was last minute and I needed a T-shirt, yes, I'd pay, I'd pay that, yeah. Tracy? It would depend on the situation, I think. So, I think, yes, I would. And if, like Daniel, it was last minute, uh, I think I would, knowing that somebody, you know, is, it's better for the environment if somebody's cycling rather than in a car or a van. Uh, I probably wouldn't, just because usually when I buy things online, I'm not buying one item. I tend to not buy anything for a couple of months and then buy a load of things at once from the same website. So if I'm buying clothes, sometimes I'll wait and then I'll buy two pairs of jeans and five t-shirts. So I'm not necessarily waiting and need it the next day. I'm happy to wait a full five days for free delivery. So I'm also can't really imagine that being practical in my case for someone trying to cycle with loads and loads of products on the back, basically. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't. <clears throat> but if, it, if it's urgent, I'd just go. And like, if I know it's urgent, I'd, I'd rather just go in the store. Uh, I don't mind paying. Um, I, I don't, I would, I'd rather have the free delivery and wait. Okay. That's great. Oh, well, that, that's an interesting discussion. Um, we, we have, I, I think we now need to move on to the next section, which is about omnichannel. Uh, so, Rachel, this is, this is obviously bringing together everything uh, into to buying, enabling customers to buy through the channel that works for them at the right moment. What have you found on this in your research? Yeah, so Omnichannel, or Unified Commerce, as the new cool kids are calling it, I've seen that popping around. Um, it is the new normal, but evidence shows that it's not just about selling online and selling in store, it's about meeting your customers' needs on each platform to influence sales, full stop. Um, probably not something Gen Z are buying right now, but FCS's website recently uh, news is vital to, their, uh, to influencing 95% of sales that take place in their stores. Um, and with Gen Z, our research found that overall they actually prefer to shop directly through a retailer in store, um, as we discussed earlier. Um, shopping has become a leisure activity um, as well as a necessity. So Gen Z, 74% of Gen Z prefer to buy directly through a retailer in store, 66% buy directly through a retailer online, 54% buy 
through an online marketplace, and 14% of Gen Z that they browse online and buy in store when shopping for fashion in particular. Um, Martin, we've heard a lot about specific retailers today, um, but what are the top 500 doing as a group in general in terms of omni-channel? The top 500 as a group, um, so only a minority of the largest retailers are online only. 82, which is about 16% of the UK top 500 are online only, and only 12 of the top 100 are. So while well, retail is shifting online, so are the high street companies, um, which are growing their online stores to be um, significant chunks of their businesses, 30, 40, 50%. And online gi only giants aren't necessarily always going to be online only. So one example of that would be eBay's recent tie-up with Argos. And clearly it's all the value in having that physical touch point with consumers. Um, so multi-channel appears to be um, the most dominant format. In terms of returns, that helps as well. So you've got 84% um, of the UK top 500, uh, which operate stores. Um, half of them allow stores to be used as a return point for online orders. Um, also, of course, collection. So uh, click and collect is, is something which has grown in popularity. Although we have noticed that the speed with which collection can be available, so expedited collection, same day collection, next day collection, are actually less popular this year than they were 12 to 18 months ago among the UK top 500. So same day collection has had a seven percentage point decline. So it was 21% and is now 14%. And next day collection has had an even bigger drop, uh, 15 percentage point decline from 44% to 29%. So um, clearly it's not all about uh, increasing speed in terms of collection. Um, although we obviously try not to speculate, I, I wonder if this is to do with click and collect maturing a little bit to be more about convenience and finding the right time window for the consumer, and it's less about um, getting it ASAP. Um, but as I mentioned earlier, I think we, we discussed uh, next day delivery. That's more popular this year. Um, and same day delivery is also more popular. So it's just collection, which is heading in the other direction. Yeah, thanks, Martin. So let's talk about click and collect. Does, who uses click and collect? No. On occasion. On occasion. Yeah. <clears throat> if you were to use Click and Collect, what kind of would make your ideal shopping scenario? Uh, well, the only time I ever really use Click and Collect is if I know that I'm going to be next to one of the stores which offers it within the next couple of days. Um, so I work on a retail park and I know if I'm going to work, you know, in, if I'm in work on a Saturday into Wednesday, there's no point in waiting for delivery to get delivered to my house. And if I know that I'm ordering from different, like JD Sports, which is located next to the, where I work, I'll do click and collect to their stocks and I can just pick it up on my way to work from the local open work. And that's really the only time I've used it any other time. It's just, I'll get it ordered to the house. When you do order with click and collect, do you ever pay for it? Um, it certain companies do, certain companies don't. I mean, it, it depends on like how much they're charging. You know, it tends to be, from my experience, the ones that charge for click and collect also charge for three to five day delivery. So if, if it's the same price, then it doesn't bother me. But if you can get free delivery within five days, or you've got to pay for click and collect, then I just wait for the delivery for free. Interesting. Anyone else have anything to add to that? No. no? Do, do the rest of you use click and collect often or no? Um, no. I did when I was in uni because I lived like in the city centre, so I did used to do click and collect because because you live in halls as well, it was really hard to get your parcels. But yeah, with, because I don't live in the city centre now, it's more like it's much more of a journey to go and get it from the shop. 
than it was if my nose is right there. Yeah. No, I don't really use. I've used it once, I think, just like when I buy like accessories or like a present for someone, but I don't really use it. Okay. So while we're on the topic of delivery, what would be it? Say cost was no option. What would be your ideal delivery option? Same day delivery. Yeah. Same day. Yeah. So same day as in how how much time? I'd or say, it depends. Yeah, it it depends what what it is. Uh, you know, if I'm ordering it late, like at seven o'clock at night, I wouldn't expect to be you know, it to be with me probably that night. But same day, day as in, if I order it at nine o'clock in the morning, hopefully it's going to be there by the time I finish work, which is you know five o'clock. So that'd be quite nice. How much do you think you'd be prepared to pay for that? Again, on the topic we was speaking before about you know if someone. You know, a cyclist you know, was delivering the items. I'd probably say around if it was if it was an urgent need of a of a t-shirt or a pair of jeans. I'd probably say around three to five pounds. Yeah. Whereas I know at the moment, I'm pretty sure I've seen someone you know where you're paying eleven pound ninety nine for same day delivery. I don't think it's worth that myself. But. Lucy. Yeah, I think I'd definitely pay for evening deliveries because I work. So, you know, nobody's in my house during the day, so I'd rather pay and have it delivered in the evening when I know, you know, someone's going to be at home, um, you know, to, to take it in. So, I'd, I'd, yeah, I'd, I think I'd pay up to, you know, a fiver or something yeah. for evening delivery on the same day, maybe. Or even, cho you know, choose an evening option. Yeah, that's what Martin was saying. It's very interesting how that has changed with that uh, and collect in store. Um, <laughs> I have a question to break in with. What's the latest time that you would accept delivery? I'd say seven o'clock. I think mine would be because anything, if it, you know, if it was from a, it depends what kind of sector it's in. So whether you're fashion or you know homework, because if it's fashion, more often than not, than not, you're going to be going out and wearing the clothes. So. You know, it's probably seven o'clock you're going out, so I'd say anything before seven, whereas if it's home work, it doesn't really matter whether it's eight o'clock, nine o'clock. So I think it depends on what you know, what what things you're selling, uh, for that question. Yeah, based off like the stuff that I buy, it doesn't really bother me. Like I'd happily accept the parcel at like quarter to twelve at night. <laughs> <laughs> I tend to stay up late anyway, so if I'm not doing anything, then it doesn't really bother me as long as I get the parcel. I'm not really too forced. Yeah, I think um, just so long as it's not like really late at night and wake everyone up. But I think like what Tracy was saying, like I'd rather be able to choose the evenings because I hate having to like go round to my neighbours and like ask for the parcel because you just know you're like annoying them when you've missed it in the day. <laughs> so it'd be good if you could choose like a specific time and then whatever time, maybe up until ten o'clock. I don't mind any time. I'm not most of the time, so I don't know. And then, like, I, I don't want to go to my neighbours because I'm very shy and I don't talk at all. <laughs> so, so, so a follow-up question on that. Uh, so would an, a one or two hour window suit everybody in the panel uh, with the ability to change delivery address on the day? Yeah. Yeah. There you yeah. go. That's a, that's a straight answer. That's great. Um, we have some other questions here which uh, don't necessarily relate to to delivery but they do to the omni channel shopping process can i throw them in now or do you want me to wait slightly Rachel? absolutely yeah go ahead great okay so ai somebody mentioned ai how important is uh, artificial intelligence in the shopping process for example in recommendations or abandoned cart emails um, quite important to me. I think I think AI just adds that like personal aspect to between like you and the retailer. Um, if I get like updated emails from ASOS that are personal to me and not just like a blank email, I think I'd feel like more of a connection, more likely to buy with the retailer. Uh, me personally, it doesn't really affect me. I only whenever I'm purchasing something, like I know what I'm going to purchase, and I'm not really interested in you know. You bought this t-shirt you know you might like this t-shirt 
the way I go about it is I wanted that specific t-shirt. If they have it, I'll buy it. If they don't, I don't tend to look for a second best option. So to me, it's not really important about having AI in search. No, it's basically the same. Like I'm not bothered about other options or anything like that. Just get what I know what I want. I'll get that. Tracy, um, yeah, similar to what Rachel said as well. I think the fact that sometimes you get personalised recommendations based on what you've bought, um, you know, and what you've been looking at. I think that that does help because you might see something that you might not have seen before. Um, so yeah, it, for me, it's it's fairly. It's, I wouldn't say it's massively important, but it's fairly important. Daniel. Yeah, I'm not too fussed. I I must say I tend to you know, know what I'm looking for and you know, if anything you know, the things what are normally advertised to me you know, when I get emails and you know so I'm, I'm not really interested in and as soon as that first email comes where I'm not really interested in the next email that comes I'm not gonna look at it. So I think, you know, the case is now I I'm not looking at any of the emails from I think you know that first e if that first email came and it was something I ended up going on to buy, then it could be a regular thing where they send you an email each each week or each month, and then you know you might be interested in it because you know from that first experience, you know you've got something out of it, you've bought a product which hopefully you want to like. Uh, so I think that first email when you send out you know a campaign is you know make sure it's very specific to the customer, uh, and you know if you can capture in that, in that first email, then I think you've you know. You'd certainly have me anyway. You know, I'd, I'd be looking each each month if I did like that first product I bought. I think we can all think about times when we've had bad recommendations yeah. and been annoyed by that. But like, good recommendations are good. Yeah. So, but there is that balance. Uh, mm -hmm. It's a very hard one to get right. I'm mm -hmm. sure. Um, Great. Sorry, so I've I've got another question. Yes. Would you appreciate more video-based e-commerce to explore and discover products? That might be, for example, a gadget show where people are talking about gadgets that you can buy or beauty or fashion. Yeah, yeah, I'd say so. In turn, a lot of the stuff I do is based um, into computers and gaming and stuff like that. And I think, although I know a decent amount about technology, I think video, uh, video commerce, like explaining to detail, you know, why buy this phone over the phone you've currently got? And if it fully, if fully went explained it, I think that'd be very helpful because a lot of times when you see things for like in like electronics, it's you know these like if it's a new phone, they show like a few new features of the phone, but they don't tell you why the phone's better. You know, am I basically buying the same phone but it's just bigger, or is is the actual benefit to buying like a new product? So I'd say like vi like videos explaining the details stuff like that would be quite helpful. That human aspect too, isn't it? What, you know about hearing from a real person rather than having to trawl yeah. through. Rather than looking at a big list of yeah. specs for a product, it's more explained to you a bit. In my opinion, a bit better. Everyone in the room shook their head about video. By the way, so is there any particular um, types of product you mentioned mobile phones, but that you would appreciate video about? Um, I don't know if it's like. Related, but definitely with them um, when I was buying shoes with ASOS, like they had like videos that go along with the picture, and like it used to show the person walking around. But I was literally looking at a pair of trainers the other day, and I clicked on the video, and the model was just sat down, like in the trainers. Like I want to see them moving around, like on feet. I just thought that was quite a strange thing. <laughs> and she was just posing like with her toes, but you know, <laughs> I want to see the product being used. I want to see how it like maybe might look on me and stuff. <laughs> I think for me as well, I think Rachel's just um, hit the nail on the head there. She said she wants to see what the products are going to be like on her. And I think that's really important with video as well, especially with fashion. You know, that there's models of all, you know, walks of life. Because, you know, it might look good on one person, but when I get my parcel in the post, it might not look good on me. So I'd like to see something that looks good on someone who's a similar shape to me so having maybe real real life you know real size models might help with video as well that's great now we we do have a question which i think might take you into the last section rachel 
Um, does shopping as a leisure activity mean there's an expectation of more experiential things in store? For example, coffee shops, uh, as well as being able to buy stock? Yeah, I think we've asked that to everyone because it's quite a hot topic right now. So, Jamil, what do you think? Like coffee shops in stores, uh, things to do in stores, experiential retailing. No, I'm not a big fan of that. Um, I'm very simple. Uh, I should go get it and then leave. Okay. Yeah, I, I mean, it's not necessarily something that I look out for, but it is quite enjoyable. So, a, a, a shop that I know that does it is. Um, in a retail park by me, next uh, the home store and the clothing store. Uh, on the top floor of that, there's a Costa Coffee, and it is quite good. You know, if you're on your feet for three hours walking around, you don't want to then walk through the sides of a retail park to do anything. If it's based inside the shop, it gives you an incentive to stay inside the shop for a bit longer, and just makes like the whole experience a bit better. Than knowing the fact that I can have a sit down, have a little drink, maybe buy to eat, carry on shopping in the same place rather than travel around quite a bit. Just Michael, just a question for me. Does it make a difference that it's a Costa? No, not yeah. really. I, I, if I like in terms of coffee, I prefer Starbucks myself. <laughs> if I was going to do anything, but it it doesn't bother me what. Even if it was an own brand one, like which they set up as in like next next coffee shop, it wouldn't bother me. Just the fact that it's there as an option is the main thing, really. Very tasty. Yeah, for me, I mean, I go shopping a lot with um, with my mum, so it's nice when we go to a department store that there's, you know, a cafe or something that, you know, it, it, it's just nice, to, as Michael said, to be able to sit down, and nine times out of ten, we stay in the same shop. Um, with other retailers, I mean, it sometimes it can be nice, you know, I know there's, there's certain shops in Liverpool, one where they have, you know, a champagne bar and, you know, a nail bar, that's quite cool, but I don't really use them, so it's, for me, it's not. Yeah, I think it's a good idea to have you know, a coffee, coffee shop within a store because I go shopping with my girlfriend for you know quite a lot, uh, and you know she could be stood there looking at the same dress for two hours, and I'm just stood <laughs> next to her not knowing what to do. So if I had you know somewhere else to go, not being a coffee shop, and you know go for a cake, and you know, I can go on my phone whilst I'm at it, then you know having to sit down, I much prefer that than just you know, standing. <laughs> next to it, not, not not doing nothing for two hours. So, yeah, I think a coffee shop's a good idea. And I do agree that I'm more inclined to go to a Costa or a Starbucks or a, you know, whatever it may be, because just because I know it, I know it's going to be a good coffee and, you know, I can get a cake and it's normally quite a nice environment there as well. And um, other than coffee shops, like, have you ever been anywhere that it was, that it was experiential? An experience that was different to coffee. Um, I was going to say about like Primark. Um, they have the beauty salon basically inside. Um, they have you can like, get like your nails done and then like this week as well as well that they're now doing like blow dries and things like that. And I think in Liverpool that'd be like really popular. You can just go in. You don't even have to leave the shop. But um, yeah, I think you can two birds one stone. <laughs> yeah, I'd agree that uh, in Liverpool city centre, you go with the top man. There's a barbers uh, in there. And I think. I've used it before, only only a couple of times, but it's good because it tends to be, if I'm going to town twice, it tends to be, you know, it, it's a friend's birthday, we're all going on a night out, so then it's like, if he's getting haircuts, it's like, oh, it's there, I don't have to then get the bus for an hour to go get me hair because it's kind of like a practical thing, and with that, it's a recognised barbershop in the city as well, so you know you're going to get a good quality thing mixed in with the shopping experience. Yeah, I like the idea of barbers as well, I think that's a good idea. Like you just said, you can sort of kill two birds with one stone. So, yeah. Rachel, I'm conscious that we're running up against time. Do you maybe want to have a quick look at the in-store technology research at this point? Yeah, sure. Um, so, in-store technology can really effectively support omnichannel, and from our research, Gen Z really do value shopping in-store, and also from our panel today. Um, 76% of Gen Z said so that they prefer to go into store to see the product in real life. Um, Real-time stock availability, which has been mentioned several times today, top the list of top the want list for.